close your eyes. Imagine with me that it is one of those summer nights that makes living in Saskatchewan one of the most beautiful things in the world. The air is warm. The breeze is gentle. The bugs aren't out yet. You're standing outside and there's a firelight and it's flickering and, and there's people all around. You're at a party. People are standing, they're laughing, they're sitting at the table and eating with another. There's talking all around, that murmur of voices, the clinking of cups, the smell of barbecue drifting by. You look into the center of the crowd and you see people dancing in the middle. And in the middle of that crowd is your son. He's dark skinned, curly hair. He's dancing with abandon. He's got a cup in one hand and there's a smile from ear to ear. He has these eyes that are laughing and bright and full of joy. There's Jesus in the center of the wedding, dancing with joy, eating, and drinking with his friends. Do you realize like Jesus' ministry on earth lasted for three years, three and a half? He... And we know that he spent at least one week of that time at a wedding feast, celebrating and having a party. Like, if you knew that your ministry was only going to be three years long, would you spend a week of that celebrating? Shouldn't Jesus be doing the, the busy, like important ministry stuff, like healing people or, or, you know, preparing the next Sermon on the Mount? But Jesus, this one that we are called to model our lives and our ministry after, didn't hesitate to spend time celebrating, dancing, eating, drinking, and laughing. Three weeks ago, when I started this series, I said that Sabbath stood in a league of its own when it comes to spiritual practices, that it is the one practice commanded by God. But there is actually a, a second spiritual practice that comes close to the command of God to stop working. And, and it probably isn't one that we would expect. It isn't scripture reading. It isn't prayer. It isn't spending time in silence and solitude. Again, all good, beneficial, even necessary to follow Jesus. But the only other spiritual practice that gets close to a command from God is celebration. Like, probably not what you were thinking about, right? And yet, throughout the Old Testament in particular, God gives regular feasts and celebrations, uh, specific times to eat, to be together with family, to celebrate what God has done and what God is continuing to do. And so when we are talking about a celebration, uh, a spiritual practice of celebration, we're saying that celebration is a way of engaging in actions that orient the spirit toward worship, praise, and thanksgiving delighting in all the attentions of the never-changing presence of the Trinity fuels celebration. What we want to do is we want to take a, a passionate, joyful pleasure in what God has done, what God has given us in God's people, in his word, in his world, and his purposes. It's interesting, like celebration isn't necessarily high on the list of activities that we uh, pe people think like Christians do, right? Um, there's this history of, of a Puritan culture that, that's evident in a lot of our churches today. So the Puritans were these English Protestants in the 16th, 17th century who came to North America from England to practice their faith. And I think it's fair to say that they were not known for being the most fun-loving Jesus people. Like, in fact, if you Google the word Puritan, like Puritan, uh, similar words in the dictionary are moralists, prude, uh, killjoys. In other words, like, not the kind of people that I want to spend my Friday night with. But I don't want to be hard on them. Like, part of their good and honest desire was to be more strict about their religious discipline. They had a pure desire to honor God with their lives. And like all of us, they were broken, sinful people who followed God imperfectly. So just because we have a, a history of Puritanism within our churches doesn't mean that we need to keep going down that road when we know that it's misguided. And one of the things that we've been learning in this series together is that the two most clearly commanded practices that God has for his people in the Old Testament are these, rest and have parties. So here's my invitation to you. As you seek to be to follow Jesus, to be transformed into his image, right? Lighten up. 
Don't take yourself so seriously. Celebrate. Have a party. Enjoy the gifts of God. The, the image of God that a lot of people have is caught by the way they see people in the church. So that goes back to our previous series on the kingdom community, our calling as Christians to live out the good news that Jesus is the king of the cosmos, that we now reflect his reign and rule in our lives and community. We show the world what kind of king Jesus is. So what kind of king is he then? Like, is Jesus a serious, hardworking killjoy? Uh, Jesus, the is he the one who goes to his neighbor's house and asks them to turn down the music and stop laughing and having a good time? Uh, at the wedding of Canaan, do you picture Jesus sitting there with his arms crossed going, it isn't fun, right? Really, a, a discipline, of uh, a spiritual practice of celebration is going to fundamentally, fun, fundamentally ask, what is your image of God? How do you imagine Jesus? What is God like? Did Jesus ever laugh? I want to really encourage you, uh, there's a video link in the description of this video uh, to Max McLean, and he's doing a one-man show of the Gospel of Mark. And, and one of the, it's just a word-for-word -word reciting the Gospel of Mark. And one of the most amazing things about that celebration, or that performance, is just how funny the Gospel of Mark is. I, assure, I am sure that Jesus laughed, that he made jokes on the road with his disciples. I am sure that Jesus looked forward to sitting around the table with his friends at the end of a long day, pouring another glass of wine and having some fresh lamb. Like, if you can't imagine Jesus at the wedding in Canaan having fun, and you think he's there on the outside tisking people, tisking? What do you what do you call that? Okay, if that's Jesus in your mind, like I just want to suggest you might need to recalibrate your image of Jesus. So Richard Foster writes in his classic, The Celebration of Discipline, that celebration of discipline, that celebration is at the heart of the way of Christ. He entered the world on a high note of jubilation. I bring you good news of great joy, cried the angel, which shall come to all people. He left the world, bequeathing, giving his joy to the disciples. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. When I hear Jesus saying that his joy is going to be in me, I'm excited. I want to live a joyful, celebratory life with Jesus. I want to celebrate to the glory of God. I want to celebrate when a new child is born, when you get a job, when you buy a new house, to celebrate birthdays and wedding anniversaries and holidays, because Jesus is present in each of, each of these things. We are called to passionately delight in the blessings of God's people, world, and word. One thing I was thinking is like every year I, I, I have American Thanksgiving booked off for the next lifetime, right? I take that Thursday off every year in November to watch football with my friends. It's a day to eat and drink and laugh and, and, and a day of football. It's a day that's good for my soul. It's a day that I'm thankful to God for the a day in which I delight in the good gifts of friendship and smoked foods and starchy chips. Like what? Um. Yeah, I, that's that's what I look forward to. It's a celebration that's on my calendar that I want to to revel in the gifts of God. And so this question is like comes back to what what is the image of God that you have? Are are you remembering that one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit living in you is joy? A joyous celebration comes from the fact that that Jesus lives in us. A Zephaniah three seventeen has been one of my favorite verses for well over ten years. And Zephaniah says about God, "The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing." God sings. God rejoices over you with songs. The psalmist writes that God fills him with the joy of his presence. I really believe that God likes parties. I think that God likes it when people live life fully and abundantly, rejoicing and celebrating in the good things that he has made. But one more example from scripture is in Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, they've discovered um, the law which has been lost for the people for a while. And, and, and Ezra and the priests, they begin to read the scriptures to them. And as they're reading the scriptures, it's getting explained. And so we read in Nehemiah 8, 9 to 12. The Nehemiah, the governor... Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep. They said this because all the people wept when they heard the words of the instruction. Go eat rich food 
Get something sweet, he said to them, and send portions of this to anyone, any who have nothing ready. This day is holy to our Lord. Don't be sad because the joy from the Lord is your strength. The Levites also calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Don't be sad. Then all the people went to eat and to drink, to send portions, and to have a great celebration, because they understood what had been said to them. The reader, uh, writer of Ecclesiastes says that there's a season for everything, a time for crying and a time for laughing, a time for mourning and a time for dancing, for celebrating. In so many ways, you would think that the response of the people in Nehemiah was right. Like they had saw that they had done wrong and they were moved to tears. But instead, the priests tell the people, don't cry. This day is a holy day. Go and get some really good food. Get some good drink. If you have extra, share it with those who don't have any. Extend your table and then don't be sad. Be joyful. And the people go and they celebrate because they understood what God is saying to them them. So do we understand what God is saying to us? Are we ready to celebrate, to have a party, to let the joy of the Lord be our strength? You and I are asked to joyously celebrate the gifts of God. Now quickly, there is a shadow side to the spiritual practice of celebration. And so two dangers I just want us to be aware of. The first is that our celebrations can become exclusionary. We only celebrate with our family or our close friends. We only invite people who can invite us back. Uh, Jesus says in Luke 14, 12 to 24, that when you hold a feast, uh, so there's an expectation that you're going to have a celebration and a feast and a party, right? That Jesus expects you to do this. So when you hold a feast, you should not only invite your rich neighbors, the ones who can invite you back later in return. Uh, I'm Instead, you should invite the, the homeless, the needy, the, the people among us who um, can never pay you back. Now, I'm really struggling with this passage and what that looks like and how to live that out in my life. I, I'm really challenged by it. And you can read it and you can uh, decide what you think as well, Luke 14. It's really unsettling. Um, but Kyle David Bennett writes about the passage. He says, we don't want to share our best wine and food with others, especially the needy. We don't want to share our goods with those who do not benefit us. We would rather give and share with those in whom we invest or those who will pay it forward. That is, back to us. But a feast is about inviting our neighbor over to nourish herself and celebrate with us. We organize and host it and we share our resources with her. So the one shadow side that we can have a tendency toward is exclusionary celebrations. We don't invite our neighbor. The second shadow of celebration is very similar, and that is that our celebration can become selfish. It can be about me and what I want. I want to sit and watch football. I don't want to think about God. I don't want to think about my neighbor. A spiritual practice of celebration can become a cover over our selfish overindulgences. In both of these things, the solution is to remember God. In the Old Testament, when God warns people that they're about to enter the land of plenty, in which there will be ease and celebrations of life are going to lure them into selfishness and complacency, the command is to remember God. Remember what he has done. Remember the reason we celebrate is that God is the author of life. I was thinking, like, as a parent, I've actually come to this point where I like my kids' birthdays more than I enjoy my own. I receive so much joy as I watch them come into the dining room and seeing all the decorations we, that were put up while they were asleep. I love to watch as they eat their favorite foods and open their presents. Their participation in the celebration brings me delight. Like, do you think God is the same way? That God, the good father, just sits back and he enjoys as his children celebrate. Enjoy food and laugh and dance. I really think so. Uh, one last piece I just want to say about celebration, and this could be a whole other sp spiritual practice and stand on its own, but it does relate. It's just like, hey, you and I, we need to play more. Uh, Ken Shigematsu in his book, uh, God in My Everything, has a whole chapter on play as a, as a core spiritual discipline practice for building our lives. He, said, he writes, that adults are so busy, so preoccupied with our agendas and tasks that we fail to enjoy the beauty right in front of our eyes. Uh, so the solution to our preoccupation with our agenda and our tasks is simply to play. And play is to do something for its own sake. Play comes in a variety of forms, including crafts, painting, acting, dancing, hiking, sports, blowing bubbles, splashing in water, laughing, joking, whatever its expression, it helps us more fully appreciate how we live and move and have our being in God. 
As someone once said that the opposite of play is not work, but it's actually depression. Like play is to simply do something because you enjoy doing it. And when we practice this, we can bring God a lot of joy as well. So how do we practice uh, celebration? Well, there's lots of things that you can do. A few of them I have. Uh, one is you can practice to sing and dance and shout like uh, David does in 2 Samuel 6. Um, just let loose. Just give a shout. Uh, try it sometime. Like just shout, dance, turn on some worship music, move your body and, 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 and celebrate that way. Uh, another way is to laugh. Like we can make fun of ourselves. I mean, like look at my face right now. I have a mustache. We just, we can celebrate and we can laugh and we can make jokes and we can make fun of ourselves uh, and, and enjoy God's gifts that way. Now, three, you can encourage celebration through creative gifts of fantasy and imagination. Play make-believe games with your kids. Help your, Let your kids teach you how to celebrate and, and to, to imagine things. Enjoy um, painting, art, creativity, or woodworking. Have some family events, a wedding, a, a, a celebration like that. Uh, celebrate the cultural holidays. We just came through Canada Day. It looked really different this year, but we have these regular uh, days within our calendar that our, our culture celebrates. And so we're invited into those celebrations to point them towards God. All of these practices include identifying and pursuing those things which bring the heart deep gladness, and reveling in them before the Lord. This may include time spent with others, sharing a meal, working, serving, laughing, worshiping, listening to music, dancing, and so on. And so I encourage you uh, to find a way to celebrate. To close, uh, Gustavo, Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, who was the father of the liberation theology in Latin America, suggested that to have a healthy spirituality it involves feeding our souls in three ways. Prayer, practicing justice, and having good things that we enjoy. Friendship, good food, wine, healthy leisure that keeps our souls mellow and grateful. And so this is the last teaching for a couple weeks. We're going to pause our gatherings for a few weeks now, but I wanted to pause on this third practice because my invitation to each one of you is to go and practice celebration, reveling in the things that bring your heart joy before God, inviting God to be part of your celebrations during this summer season. And so grace and peace, and we will see you again soon.